What's up, people? Lance Samoza here, the guy with the one tech mind. I've spent just over a month with the new cute little baby iPad mini 6. And in this video, I'm gonna explain my top likes and dislikes after using it nearly every single day since it came out. And yes, fair warning, there will be a side of jelly served with the main course. The sixth generation iPad mini spec sheet is just downright impressive. Just imagine if iPad Pro Air and iPhone 13 somehow had a freaky love child and you're not too far off. Okay, maybe don't imagine that. It packs an 8.3 inch rounded corner 60 hertz LCD screen up from 7.9 into the sleek industrial iPad Pro design at just over half a pound. Barely heavier than the new iPhone 13 Pro Max from which it takes the A15 Bionic chip and optional 5G capabilities. It has support for Apple Pencil 2, a 12 megapixel rear camera with True Tone Flash up from eight megapixels. It borrows the Touch ID button from iPad Air, the 12 megapixel ultra wide selfie camera with center stage from the Pro, and it shows up its elder by replacing the legacy lightning connector with USB-C. Noticeably missing is Apple's dynamic 120 hertz refresh rate technology called ProMotion found on iPad Pro and now iPhone Pro, which is totally an understandable trade-off for a device this size, running $499 for 64 gigs of storage and $649 for 256 with Wi-Fi only. And with all these upgrades, poor iPad Air is left almost completely behind in the technological dust because the only subjective advantages it has over the mini, at least right now, are its larger screen and the smart connector for keyboard support. All right, now that we got all the specs out of the way, let's get on to what I like about it. While I love the updated flat edge design, I actually think my old iPad mini 2 with its rounded sides is slightly more comfortable to hold one handed, but the hard edges on the new mini feel more solid and reassuring. I had no issues holding it for long periods of time without fatigue. And you have to remember the flat edge design here, whether you like it or not, is essentially required for Apple Pencil 2 support due to the wireless charging mechanic. The top and bottom have speaker hull cutouts per use. And looking at them, you might be inclined to think that the mini has four total speakers, but boy, how wrong you would be because it actually only has two. You see, half of all the speaker holes are purely ornamental for the sake of balancing out the design. The new iPad mini 6 is an extremely capable machine, thanks to all its new technologies. So much so that I think Apple could have called it iPad Pro mini and gotten away with it because it can handle almost everything I use my larger M1 iPad Pro for, from jotting down quick post-it style reminders via the new Quick Notes feature in iOS 15 to redesigning the OneTech Mind logo, as you may have noticed, in Affinity Designer without skipping a single beat. It also makes for an excellent remote gaming device when paired with another controller. And those two speakers, well, they can get pretty loud. I mean, they aren't nearly as good as my 13 Pro Max phone speakers, sounding a bit thinner and tinny, but for a tablet this size, they are more than good enough for watching YouTube videos or just playing some background noise when you need to. It even has all the iOS multitasking capabilities, including split view, slide over, drag and drop, and picture in picture for videos. And on one hand, it's great that Apple didn't hold back multitasking support from their smallest iPad. But on the other hand, they didn't do a whole lot to make the multitasking work better for iPad mini on its smaller screen size, which I will get to in a minute. And while its display refreshes at the usual 60 Hertz, this isn't a problem at all when drawing or writing with Apple Pencil 2, I found. Is there a noticeable difference compared to the 120 Hertz ProMotion capable iPad Pro? Yeah, but not enough to make a gigantic difference or notice without comparing them literally side by side. I'm sure if you were digitally drawing or painting, you might notice a little bit more difference, but as for the average person with limited artistic capabilities like me, it's extremely negligible in daily use. And this is my first experience with the Touch ID button that's taken from iPad Air, and I do like it, though for the first few days I really missed Face ID and I was staring at my mini like an idiot waiting for it to unlock and wondering what the hell was going on. But then the Touch ID muscle memory from pre-iPhone 10 days came back pretty quickly, and while I'd like to think I prefer Face ID to Touch ID, that's not entirely true. More on that later too. 
Center Stage, a feature that keeps you in frame on video calls like FaceTime is another one of those Apple touches you absolutely miss when you don't have it. So it's a total joy to see the iPad Pro feature trickle down all the way to iPad mini and even the regular iPad now. iPad Air is surely getting serious FOMO. It also took me about a week or so to get accustomed to the new volume buttons due to their placement on the top edge and how they work. You see the plus and minus direction dynamically changes depending on the orientation of iPad mini. Volume up will always be the button on top in landscape or right in portrait, and volume down will be the opposite, except when rotation lock is enabled from control center, in which case the buttons will operate according to the locked orientation. My only complaint is the volume buttons on my iPad Pro and iPhone don't dynamically change. So this is something you specifically have to remember when using iPad mini. And that's why it takes a little bit more getting used to. I absolutely love the addition of USB-C and thanks to it, I've started using the mini to record audio for these videos. Basically the mini powers my USB audio interface, which provides 48 volt phantom power to my microphone. And recording can be captured via a number of apps like Ferrite or GarageBand, all over the single USB-C cable. And I realize this use case doesn't apply to everyone, maybe to some musicians out there hooking up an instrument or two, but it's a perfect example of what is possible when universal standards are embraced. And if technology is half the reason I love iPad mini, the other half is its amazing portability and form factor. It has become my default device to use on the couch, in the kitchen and other places for watching videos, browsing Reddit, looking up recipes, buying stuff I don't need on Amazon, you know, general destructive behavior. But I wanna take this thing everywhere because it's dainty size and formidable power are a perfect combination for accomplishing many tasks. And in some cases with even greater ease or more gracefully than my iPad Pro or iPhone. For example, I used it for my day job to enter infrastructure data into a huge spreadsheet while walking by taking advantage of the floating keyboard in iPad OS. I've done this kind of data collection before on a larger iPad and a laptop, which proved to be more cumbersome and arguably less efficient than just using my mini. And by the way, this walk took about four hours with the mini on almost the entire time at around 80 to 90% brightness. And when I finished, I still had about 65% battery left, which is super impressive. And unless you have really short fingers, traditional typing on the screen and portrait orientation is quite doable, if not a little more prone to errors than compared to typing on an iPhone. But for all these reasons, iPad mini just feels like the device I wanna take everywhere and run my life with. It has become the MVP of my daily tech arsenal and serves a niche but important purpose. I use my 5K iMac for video editing and my 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro with its magic keyboard for word processing on the go, heavy split screen multitasking, watching HDR movies, or if I just need a bigger canvas. I use my iPhone 13 Pro Max as my car key when I'm just out and about or when I need to take the best picture possible. An iPad mini fills in all the gaps throughout the day when I just need to get something done quickly with more room for activities, like ordering groceries, getting ahead of our Christmas shopping list, or just zoning out for a few minutes. All right, all right, that's enough fawning over iPad mini. Let's bring some balance to the force with my dislikes. But first, if you're finding this video helpful, please consider giving it the old thumbs up, subscribing to help me build the most obsessed Apple community on YouTube, and ringing that bell so you don't miss anything else. I bet you can't guess what my first dislike is. For me, the display is the most disappointing part of iPad mini or the one area I wish Apple would have invested more in. It does have a P3 color gamut for displaying large amounts of colors and true tone capability to adjust its color temperature to your environment, but it still only has a maximum brightness of 500 nits. And while this is more than enough for indoors and adequate for outdoor use in the shade, if you go anywhere near direct sunlight, you're gonna have a bad time. Even with the brightness all the way up, the display is hard to see. So if you're thinking of using this for something like reading books outside, a Kindle would be much better suited for the job. And then there's the dreaded jelly scroll effect, which is the latest in a long line of new Apple hardware controversies. You see, Apple placed the display controller on the long edge of iPad mini, and because the two halves of the display update at slightly different rates, 
scrolling text in portrait orientation may appear to have a jelly-like effect, with the far side appearing to lag slightly behind the other. For the first couple days, I didn't notice anything until the internet erupted into outrage and I specifically checked for it on my Mini. And ever since then, anytime I scroll text at a sort of medium-ish to slow speed in portrait, I just can't help but seeing it because my eyes and brain are now looking for it. At least the effect is imperceptible when using the iPad in landscape or when doing anything else really but scrolling text in portrait. And this sucks because I love using my iPad mini in portrait, just as if it were an iPhone plus Mega Max, which could very well pass as real Apple branding these days. So this complaint is absolutely not without merit. But I'm not asking for pro motion here, only for a little bit better brightness and for this device to not have this distracting effect. And while the mini Mini's refresh rate is an acceptable 60 hertz and that would be fine. Jelly Scroll adds insult to injury when you're hopping between ProMotion capable screens like my 13 Pro Max and iPad Pro and I would imagine the new MacBook Pros. It honestly kind of makes my eyes bug out a little bit. Long story short, if you like to read on your iPad and have sensitive eyes, this may be annoying to you. I'm going to live with it because of how valuable the Mini is to me otherwise. I've also noticed a noticeable lack of polish throughout iPadOS, including how the interface and fonts are scaled. That's partially because iPadOS 15 imposes these chonky borders on every iPad in order for widgets, app icons, and folders to live in harmony on the home screen, which is bearable on a larger iPad, but way less forgivable on iPad Mini. It makes what is already a small screen feel even smaller and I always have set font size to the smallest possible on pretty much every computer I've ever had while my youthful eyesight lasts, but iPad mini is the first device I've ever had to increase it on, in addition to the use large app icon setting to make things a bit more legible and tappable. Speaking of tappable, I've found having any more than seven-ish apps in the dock plus suggested apps decreases the icon sizes dramatically in portrait mode, making them more difficult to select. This is the one time I've ever been thankful to have thin fingers, and even then I sometimes open the wrong app. Another oddity is in regards to some weird UI lag or random animation stuttering. This is completely separate from Jelly Scroll and feels like the system is just dropping frames. For instance, when opening Spotlight Search, the app library, or bringing up the dock from inside another app, sometimes there can be noticeably jarring animation stutter or delay. It doesn't happen every time, maybe two or three times per day, just enough to be distracting. But come on, seriously? I really doubt this is a hardware issue. I did a full reset and updated iOS 15.1, but that didn't help. So I'm hoping this is just a lack of optimization that Apple can correct via software. And aside from Jelly Scroll, doing a few other things in portrait orientation is a bit of a mixed bag. First is portrait split view. It's a bit laughable on any iPad with the roughly 80-20% split between apps, but it's nearly pointless on iPad mini. Slide over is a much better experience because your main app retains its full size, and it's my preferred method for a quick copy-paste or drag and drop. Suffice it to say, both these multitasking modes are way more useful in landscape where there's just enough room to get things done efficiently. And because the screen is narrow in portrait, it's very easy to accidentally trigger the new split screen app selection in iOS 15 if you're just trying to see your notifications or if you're tap on the status bar to scroll all the way up a list. And do not get me started with the messages app where there is no way to toggle or hide your conversations list. So when you're typing a message, half your screen is always consumed by information you really don't need. The only way around this is to open a single conversation in a new window via context menu each time, which makes it totally not worth it and is too hidden of a feature for most to find. For storage, I bought the 64 gig model because I don't store a ton of data on my actual iPad, but any way you look at it, 64 gigs is a puny amount of storage for 2015, let alone 2021. And if you need more, prepare to shell out an additional 150 bucks for probably too much storage at 256 gigs. With only a handful of apps in my iCloud photo library set to optimize iPad storage, I have a comfortable 20-ish gigs available, which I can't imagine filling up based on what I use this device for. But if you are planning to download even a modest amount of music, movies, or create any content beyond writing, you are definitely going to want the 256 gig model. Lastly, now that I've been using Touch ID on my Mini and Face ID on my iPad Pro, it is easy to see how a combination of both would make for a perfect system. Now I'm definitely not bashing Touch ID, but this is more of just a realization and hope that at some point, 
all the face and touch ID technology will be miniaturized and cheap enough to have both in our devices. So while there is room for improvement on the hardware and software side, the sixth generation iPad mini has the neurons in my one tech mind firing on all cylinders for how quintessentially iPad it is. It is the perfect hold in your hands tablet for anyone who needs an iOS device bigger than their iPhone, which also fits in their pocket. Like a doctor checking on patient vitals a student taking down a quick note in class, or an artist working on their next concept. And yes, even an aspiring YouTuber. And you may think looking at its size that it's also perfect for the kiddos, but I'd still recommend the standard iPad due to its larger screen, same 12 megapixel selfie cam with center stage, Apple Pencil 1 support, and cheaper price. So let me know what you think about iPad mini and this video down in the comments below. If you picked one up and what your experience has been so far. Or if you have any additional questions about it, I will do my absolute best to get you some answers. And until next time, thanks for listening to my One Tech Mind.